At the heart of every paddler beats a passion for water, competition, and conservation. This unique podcast aims to unite all the paddling styles and stories under one common heartbeat. This is The Paddler's Pulse. Welcome back, paddle people! Whoop, whoop. I can see you in the back row bouncing. That's right. You are here for another edition of The Paddler's Pulse. My name is Greggy, and I am super stoked that you joined us today. Today, we've got an amazing episode. Oh, such a good conversation. Today is for you dragon boaters out there. That's right, we got some dragon boat action for you. I had a chance to sit down and chat with an amazing woman named Kristen Styx, who runs is the brains behind the operation Paddle Chica, which is a fantastic blog dedicated to the sport of dragon boat. So she has so many fun stories, one of which, <clears throat> <clears throat> let's get ready to rumble! You're going to learn exactly why that phrase has a lot of power in today's conversation. So stay tuned for that. Also, Miss Kristen has done some amazing stuff. Spent some time in Costa Rica as a teacher, then turned to the sport of dragon boat, which took her all around the world. A little side note, she used to be a model for Gatorade and Rollerblade, and I totally embarrass her by talking about that, but it's a great story, and you're going to learn more about that. Um, San Diego native now lives in Canada. She's done so many great things. We met at the uh, Long Beach Dragon Boat Festival in California. Um, and I heard a story about paddling the Panama Canal, which completely enamored me. I was super, super stoked. So I reached out to her and she had a chance to sit down and share some of this great stuff. So today's episode dedicated to you dragon boaters out there. The, the wonderful woman behind the amazing blog, Paddle Cheeker. Her name is Kristen Styx. And for some of you, this will be the first time you've heard her speak, which is super exciting. She has a great personality, wonderful energy, and we had a really, really good time. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, here on the Paddler's Pulse, Miss Kristen with Paddle Chica. We're diving right in. All right, you guys, thank you again for joining us at another episode of the Paddler's Pulse. My name is Greggy, and I am super stoked to hang out with this cool chick that you guys are going to get to know with me. Her name is Kristen, and she started a blog called Paddle Chica back in 2015, February of 2015, which gives light and beauty and grace and fun and joy to the Dragon Boat community. So welcome, Kristen. Thanks. Glad to be here. Very <laughs> yeah, excited so about this. You're joining us from where? Where are you at right now? I am in Toronto, of all places. Of all places. Toronto, Canada. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> so let's just dive right in. I want to know a little bit about you. How, well, first of all, how, how'd you get to Canada? But you were from San Diego, right? You're originally from, from San, San Diego. Diego. originally. I have okay. a, a whole lot of California hippie girl in me. Um, <laughs> yeah, we were talking about what you had for breakfast. Tell everybody what you had for breakfast. Right. Your I make first my breakfast. own muesli. That's so California granola chick. I love it. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Yep, make my own muesli. I'm into natural stuff, so that's I love my it. breakfast. Yep, I can resonate with that. I'm 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 kind of a hippie myself, so excellent. It's hippies good. unite. Hippies unite. That's our new brand. That's our shirt. We're gonna get shirts that say hippies unite. Love it. Love yeah. it. Um, okay, so tell me a little bit about. I want to know more about you. So from San Diego, but you moved around, and I kind of want to call you like a Renaissance woman because you've wow. done so many. I'm yeah, honest. you've done so many fun stuff and and so many fun things, and I want to hear a little bit more about them. So, high school math teacher. High school math teacher. I actually started out teaching third grade. I thought okay. that I wanted to teach little ones because my mom teaches kindergarten. Okay. And she still does, believe it or not. She's wow. uh, seventy five this year and Where still she in the kindergarten Where does she teach? class. In San Diego, she's right? In, like, that's where, yeah, in La Jolla yeah. Country Day. Oh, wow. How fun. Yeah, she's awesome. So I thought I wanted to teach little kids. I started teaching third grade, and I went, hmm, I like this, but hmm, not sure. Okay. You know, this seems you know, not quite it. I kind of worked my way up middle school and on up to high school once I found my passion for math in middle school. Okay. Um, I stuck there for quite a while and then worked my way up to high school, and I, just, I love it. Math is really awesome. Oh, that's super fun. Yeah, you're a self-proclaimed uh, nerd. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Guilty. Guilty, which is I'm, awesome. I'm always talking about like angles and paddling and and force and things like that. So. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess you bring a lot of like technical understanding and then the ability to share that with people well, in a way that's understandable. Yeah, yeah, I try. You know, maybe not always the understanding so much as the <laughs> explanation of, hey, I hope this makes sense. And, yeah. Uh, you know, but I'm always talking about angles, you know, angles of your arm, angles of the blade, angles of the shaft, all that stuff. So 
Okay, so uh, we're diving right into paddling. I have to know how how the sport of dragon boat found you. Ah, uh, good question. So when I moved to Miami, I well, actually, let's back up just a little bit. I okay. grew up in California, um, San Diego. Went to school at UCLA, um, grad school in Santa Barbara, and was always near the ocean. Oh, you hit all uh, the great coast. Yeah, that's yeah. I did, <laughs> indeed. Uh, then I went to Costa Rica, and I taught in Costa Rica for four years. So That's again, awesome. on the ocean, really enjoyed it. When I moved back to California, wait in Costa Rica. Looking- in Costa Rica, you taught math. Mm-hmm. Not yeah. got it. Okay, yeah, that was really awesome. And then I moved back to California, and I was looking for a place that had a similar climate and culture to Costa Rica. I was really actually going through culture shock when I came back. Really, so I moved to Miami. Okay, um, which is the perfect place in terms of climate and culture, okay. um, similar to Costa Rica. So I was there and I wanted to be out on the ocean all the time, but there are not, there's not much to be found in wave waves in Miami. Okay. So I was a little disappointed um, in that sense. So I was looking for something fun to do on the ocean and mm. I came across an ad for my team. Back then they, ad, they advertised on Craigslist. Really? Under yeah, under activities. A and dragon boat team adver- advertised on Craigslist. Right, looking for just you know paddlers, people, people to come join hang. our team. Oh wow, how fun! Okay, what's the name of the team? Yeah, the team is called Puff, as in like Puff the Magic Dragon. <laughs> I love it. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. Doesn't sound overly fierce, but they're actually a good team. So. Oh, I would imagine. Yeah. So so you found them on Craigslist, and then found them on Craigslist, and I was ecstatic that it was something because Miami, you know. It was interesting. Um, their activities section in on Craigslist in Miami was more like hot women needed for massage tonight, <laughs> um, wow. rather than you know we need women for our baseball team or something that got I was it, got you know, it, got looking it, got for it. whatever. Yeah. So I found this and I went, oh my gosh, they're on the water and it's like seems legit and hey, let's go. I was too shy to go by myself. I'm not gonna lie. I'm, <laughs> I, I was very shy and I grabbed one of my colleagues who I didn't even know that well. Uh-huh. And she she was the swim coach at the school that I taught at. And I said, hey, let's go do this. This seems like fun. You're an active person. Come on, you're coming with me. So we <laughs> went. And I am so glad that I took her because she was hooked from the second. She was literally like, oh, my God, this is the best thing in the world. Oh, wow. And me, I was like a little bit, um, shall we say, less so. Like okay. the, the first warm up was two and a half minutes long. And at the end of it, I literally thought to myself, oh, holy hell, people do this for fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Everything man. hurt, and I could not imagine why people would do it. Yeah. And so I was a little bit slower to get into the passion of it, shall we say. Okay. She was straight okay. off the bat. But she was hooked right off the bat. Okay. She was hooked. And now the ironic thing is, so so we both were, were there for the, the first kind of introductory training session with the team, mm. and everyone on the team thought that she was going to be just this promising new paddler, and okay. she was going to be amazing and all that. Within a month, they didn't see her again. She was gone. Oh, oh wow. Well. She, <laughs> she was flame. kind of one of those like fair weather paddlers of like, mm. this is awesome now, and then now I'm going to go here and do that. Whatever. Fine. You know, that worked for her. The but flame burned she fast. Was, okay. Right. She was the one that got me thinking it was so amazing on that first day when really my, every muscle in my body was telling me it was not so amazing. Yeah, I think that's a theme among that's a theme among dragon boaters for sure that I've heard. Yeah, most people um, we put a team together last last year that, you know, it was all it was all outrigger people and a couple of dragon boat. Uh, and they were like, wow, you've got to be kidding me. Like the, the people the same thing, like people do this like they were blasted because of it. But somehow it hooked you. So later you came it, back. Yeah, I think um, her passion for it was contagious, which mm. was definitely <laughs> beneficial to me. And I think the team aspect of it hooked me. And I really feel like, you know, I'm glad that you said how did dragon boating find me? Because I find that a lot of people when they're in a space in their life that they need a team for whatever reason, they tend to find dragon boating. Interesting. Um, and we've, we had a lot of people join the team after divorces or breakups or moves or whatever. Um, there's certain personal things in your life that happen mm. and dragon boating finds you. So I like that you use that since it's very apropos. So I think I was in a, a place in my life where I enjoyed the support of the team. I enjoyed the camaraderie. 
Um, it was something that I was looking for and lacking, you know, being new. Well, at that point, I had lived in Miami for a little while, a couple years, I suppose. But I still didn't feel, you know, my life at that point was very much home and school, home and school. Well, school being my work, work. you yeah, know, yeah. teaching. And I didn't really have a life outside of that. Oh, okay. And so Dragon Boating provided that because suddenly I had this amazing social network, this great team. And we were going to races. I was exploring parts of Florida that I hadn't been to. And it was just a really good social outlet, and it became a passion from that, I think. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And I love that you you kind of, I guess, extrapolate a little bit on the on the idea of having a sport find you. I think it's been very similar in other team sports, like, you know, like Outrigger and stuff, because that, that's how I found it. And not a lot of people know that. But, you know, I was at a place just like that uh, in my <laughs> life where I needed to engage a deeper layer of connectivity to the world around me because I was kind of in my little space. You know what's great? Um, if if you get it, if you get some time, grab a book called Tribe by Sebastian Younger, and it explains almost like on a on a on a historical and, and anthropological level why humans are designed for that. We got a little off topic there, but pick it up because I think you would totally dig it because because it's exactly Excellent. that thought. You know, yeah. Okay, so Perfect. so dragon boat. Uh, so there you are. You're you're in Florida. You're diving into this new sport your friend has taken a hike already did she ever come back no she disappeared and and like i said she was more of just a colleague i didn't really oh, okay, know her that okay. well and so okay. i have no idea where she is now or what no she at one point she told me my dragon has gone silent like, okay, <laughs> my dragon well has gone silent <laughs> Um, Wow, that's interesting. So that kind of brings me to the next idea, which is you created this amazing blog called Paddle Chica. And I'm wondering if she's ever found it, because that would be amazing. (laughs) Wouldn't it? Interesting connection there. I doubt it, because I don't think that she's paddling anymore at all. Okay. Um, But who knows? I have no idea if she's out there. Hey, how are you doing? (laughs) Yeah, there you go. Um, Thank you for (laughs) leading Kristen to this space, because now she has a massive impact because of it on other dragon boaters and other paddlers. Um, So tell me about Paddle Chica. Wow. Uh, So I did not ever imagine myself being a blogger. I, in fact, in all honesty, about three years ago, I didn't even know what a blog really was. <laughs> I had heard about it. I'd been somewhat introduced to it, but I didn't really know. I was, well, I was lucky enough to learn about blogging because I was working for a friend of mine who was a photographer, and she taught me how to write blog posts because she needed her blog updated. So oh, I was okay. helping her with them. Oh, got it. And okay. So I learned, you know, the ins and outs, the basics of WordPress and, and how to you know, ooh, how to put photos in and all that <laughs> fancy stuff. <laughs> and and I, I really learned it as a tool for storing information. And so while I was writing these blog posts for her, I had started coaching a breast cancer survivor team in Miami called Save oh, wow. Our Sisters, also Save known as sisters. SOS. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. And so as I'm coaching them, I'm noticing that they're just starving for information. They were so hungry for knowledge. After practice, they'd pull me aside individually and ask me questions. And quite often it was the same questions, just different people. Okay. And so my answer typically, you know, I would answer them in person, but I'd also say, you know what, I'll send out an email about that. That's a good question. You're not the only one with that question. I'll send out an email with it, with that information. Eventually it got to the point, it was like, oh, can you send that email again? I lost it. Mm. I was like, okay, well, we need a better system. Let's figure out where we can store this information. I all, thought, all of well, this, by the way, is the makings of a good teacher, obviously. Oh. <laughs> These are like, so clearly, sweet. yeah, yeah. Okay, so. So I was thinking, where can I store this information? And yeah. it dawned on me that a blog might be the best way to store it. So then they could access it any old time they wanted to easily. Mm-hmm. I had absolutely no idea that it would become anything other than basically a, an online filing cabinet for <laughs> the paddlers on my team oh, wow. to look back for, at things. So the first blog post I created was core exercises because they were all asking about core exercises. So it's, sure. you know, what can you do to strengthen your core? That was blog number one. Got it. And then blog number two was um, nutrition information, and it has my muesli recipe in case you're Ah, okay, I'm going to go get that. And blog number three was core exercises part two. Ah. So I was just basic stuff that they were asking about. Yeah, just like, yeah, just like you said. Blog number four was how to be an expert paddler. 
<laughs> and that hey. went worldwide. And I was wow. looking at the stats and I was like, oh my God, there's people in Australia reading this. There's oh, wow. people in Italy reading this. There's people in France. There's people in Canada. There's people like everywhere. Like, whoa, it completely blew my mind. How did that feel? It was shocking because I, I thought I'm just one little coach in Florida who was just trying to get information to this group of maybe 40 women. Uh -huh. And suddenly more than these 40 women are reading this. This oh, is interesting. Wow. You know, yeah. I had no idea that, that it would be of interest to anyone, mm. let alone make an impact on, on people. So it was kind of neat. It shocked me, definitely. I was yeah. not prepared at all for it. But what a um, fun thing. I'm, I'm really grateful that I named the blog something that was fun and not something that was like stupid, you know, like <laughs> Coach Kristen or something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I can't think of an example, but I think you know what I mean. Like, I think I know what, it, I know what you mean. Yeah. a fun name that could kind of translate well and just catch on. I don't know. Yeah, totally. Uh, so once I realized that it, I was maybe on to something, I was like, okay, well, I'm still enjoying writing for my ladies, the, the, the breast cancer survivor team. Right. And I really just continued with them in mind and and I continued with their questions in mind and their questions were always the basis of my blog posts always. Oh, okay so we'd have a discussion about something on the boat and I'd say okay I'm writing a blog post about that you uh -huh. know? Um, for example one of the one of the ones I laugh about is the uh, blog post on butt blisters because we all get them <laughs> we all get them any kind of right now yeah, but nobody really talks about that. A moment of silence for all of those butt blisters. Oh. <laughs> yes. So what was that? Uh, what was that like? So uh, I'm sorry. What? What was that like? The not the butt the the blo the. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought you were asking. No, no, the post itself. Okay, right. Well, the post was was more of just the acknowledgement that yes, you are likely to get them in your paddling career if yeah. you are paddling correctly, and here's what we do about them and I gave some suggestions and then other people wrote in with their suggestions and you know depending on their region what was available mm, and what mm -hmm. was recommended so it was it was actually very informative for me too because oh well that's a good idea I've never thought of that oh that's great yeah so you know nobody wants to talk about their rear but <laughs> it's important <laughs> but it's part of the game yeah oh wow exactly. how fun so, of your blog posts, what has been, well, what's been the one that's like the most popular? Ooh, well, most popular depends on how you're going to define that, honestly. Okay, define them both. I have some that have the most views. Okay. But those are often because of being controversial. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, the most controversial one that I wrote was titled Every Seat Counts. Mm. And it was talking about how, you know, you're on a boat of 20, there is no bad seat, of if course. you will, and I'm saying yeah. that with air quotes that absolutely no one can see, I realize that. <laughs> yeah, so she has air quotes up, guys. There okay. is no air bad seat. Air quotes around the bad seat, yes. <laughs> but people were very uh, passionate about that blog post in particular. I think some of the information that I shared, they maybe didn't agree with or did agree with it, and I think it was their own personal experience as well, mm. whether as a coach or as a paddler. You know, yeah. often we put the newer paddlers in the back so they can, well, for many reasons. One, so that they can watch what's going on and kind of get a feel for the boat and see what their body movement should look like by sure. looking at people in front of them. Sure, and also, you know, if they maybe have timing issues, they'll sit towards the back so that they're not interrupting anyone else in the front. Yeah. But that's not a race boat. <laughs> you know? Right. On a race boat, every seat is important. And you're not putting new paddlers back there just to watch. <laughs> They're not out for sightseeing cruise. It's right. a race boat. Mm -hmm. So my point on, on the post was about how, you know, don't disregard seats 9 and 10. Mm. Uh, they, they have value as, as a lot of teams call it, the rockets. Um, they're in the back and they have to deal with that messy, disgusting water that comes mm. from everyone else's paddle. I've never um, heard the term the rockets. Explain that. That's kind of fun. Yeah. I, you know, I don't use it myself. I've just heard people oh. call it that. And I, I like that because there's something about maybe rocket boosters, rocket yeah. launchers of, of that sort. I think I actually did use it. I may have used that term in the post because other okay. people have called it that. Um, okay. Yeah. Anyhow, that's, it's a good one. Um, so my but point being is seats nine and 10 are not the backseat of a cab. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. 
I mean, and, just to, to know for sure, take those two seats out entirely. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, same thing with like, uh, you know, with Outrigger, take seat, take seat five out, you know, in a, in a 10 or 12 or 15, 20 mile race, you know it. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So they're all important. I, Absolutely. I agree with that So it, it was just a post about that and there was an awful lot of um, back and forth about the accuracy of that information and mm. um, you know people can read into things whatever they want sure. uh, and and take it to whatever level they want and I think sure. that there was a bit of controversy about it it got posted on Dragon Boat Forum and there was a huge amount of um, arguing back and forth about it oh, but, interesting. but I think I said interesting it just goes to show that people are passionate about portions of the sport right very true very true and another controversial one was i wrote about ringers and the debate about whether teams should or should not be using so-called ringers again with the air quotes the so-called ringers okay what's a Uh, ringer real quick well that was the focus of that was basically that if your team has decided to be competitive and you know in dragon boating you need 20 paddlers quite often you need a few more because you need to have spares or or subs that's a lot of people and you maybe only have 19 people that are race ready okay. so you may call upon someone from an, another club to race with your team in order to help that team your team to be competitive got it okay. so the debate being do you use a paddler who's not ready to race who's newer who has um you know maybe doesn't have the endurance the strength the whatever capabilities to sit in that race seat or do you uphold your team's mission of being competitive and got take it. only a very competitive boat so got it got again it. okay another yeah, controversial, controversial topic yeah, totally wow how, how fun and okay so some good some good posts a little controversial a little heavy what's like one of the more lighter what's one of the more fun engaging weird lighter um let's see well i wrote one that was more just for fun on a friday that just kind of came to me i actually originally years ago wanted to write a book about oh, dragon fun. boating it was not informational at all in nature it was just, just story about no <laughs> Oh. It was about all the um, things that we say in dragon boating that can be completely misconstrued mis- oh, <laughs> uh, and sound really dirty but aren't. Yeah, give me an example. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, right? Hey, if you were going to write the book, you... Them. Yeah, <laughs> you, are, no you are read. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, well, don't, don't pull out so late you're getting me wet. That's horrible. Okay. <laughs> uh, grab the shaft a little harder or don't hold the shaft so hard. Slide oh. your hand down on the yeah. shaft. All kinds of things. Yeah, so any anybody listening right now who paddles gets all of that, by the way. Exactly. Thank God, yeah. right? Because yeah, we've all it done it at really some awful. level. Sure. Okay, yeah. that's super fun. <laughs> so that was probably the the post that was just the most fun, yeah, you know, lighthearted, just, nothing yeah. no serious brain taxing information or anything sure. like that. Sure, sure. Oh man. Mm. So, so we're, I want to back up a little bit and park kind of in a space where, you know, Dragon Boat, as I've seen it for a lot of people, has been an incredible vehicle for meeting other people, meeting other um, groups, going to other parts of the world. Like, where has it taken you from an adventure standpoint? Wow. I've been so lucky to travel and to explore and Dragon Boating's really um it's been so helpful for that. You're absolutely right. I my first adventure, if you will, mm-hmm. was I was just going to visit a friend of mine in Wales. I looked for a local team. You know, thank God for the internet. Sure. I did a little Google search and found the Bristol Empire Dragons, and yeah. they were absolutely willing to take me on board for one of their training sessions. Now, mind you, this was in December. Oh, wow. In England. Burr. I was yeah, freezing. so it was probably really warm. So much like Florida. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I was dying. They were so nice. They outfitted me. They brought me like 12 pairs of booties to wear all at once and oh, wow. all kinds of stuff. They were so much fun. So um, that was my first time paddling with another team and in another country, oh, which cool. was really neat. And that kind of got me thinking to how welcoming paddlers are in general. It's just a culture that I think everyone kind of connects on that paddling level and, and wants to be welcomed. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there so, is a much deeper level of tribe in all of that. Yeah, exactly. Right. So then I started, um, traveling for races and mm. I've been to Hong Kong, raced in Hong Kong twice. That was my first international race. I think, yeah, it was Hong Kong. 
um, raced in Malaysia. It was oh, wow. amazing. I raced with the U.S. national team in Hungary. And that's oh, wow. a beautiful, beautiful race venue in Seged. Oh, cool. Okay. Raced where else? I've practiced with the American Dragons in Singapore. That was really <laughs> neat. I wow. happened to be in Singapore and looked up the team and found that their practice schedule worked and they were willing to take us on board. Same thing with the team in Beijing. When I was in Beijing, I contacted a team and was lucky enough to go out with them. Oh man, that's amazing. So, yeah, a lot of really neat neat adventures around the world. I raced in Italy as well. That was a lot of fun. You know, it's interesting. I I know a little bit about Dragon Boat, but as I'm hearing this, I'm not I guess I wasn't as aware that it's everywhere. It like seems it's so to be everywhere. Every, yeah, and that's really cool. So you got to try. You had told me kind of when you and I met was at uh, it was up in Long Beach. Mm-hmm. Um, Long Beach race. Yeah, had the greatest chat, and you had started to tell me about one of your travels. You had done um, not Dragon Boat, but just paddled the Panama Canal. Yeah, that was probably the coolest <laughs> thing I've ever done. And I was like, like I was like starstruck. I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> what? People can do that? Like that is a thing? And you were telling me about the boats that and what are they? What they're called and. And I want to hear that again, because that, I mean, that's just so amazing. Right. So they use Cayucos, and Cayucos. that's a, a native Panamanian boat. And if you can imagine an outrigger canoe, like a six-man outrigger, <clears throat> excuse me, outrigger canoe, it's actually, the Cayucos are four-man, though. Okay. But picture your six-man outrigger canoe, take the ama off of it, and now sit on the floor. <laughs> that sounds awesome. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> It's definitely exciting, I'm not going to lie. Oh, I would imagine. Uh, apparently some of the best paddlers, and this is, I've just heard this, I've not seen it in action, but some of the best paddlers train by sitting on one of those big um, exercise balls. Yeah, like the Bosa balls? Yes. And then they put their feet on a basketball. Oh, so wow. how hard that would be. Oh, wow. Talk about a core workout. Right. Exactly. Yeah, balancing. It's oh, great. Oh, wow. Okay, okay. So, this is a three-day race that goes from the Atlantic side to the Pacific side. It's organized. You know, I'm probably not going to get all the details right here, and I That's probably okay. should have looked that up. But, but um, I believe it was started by the Boy Scouts down there. Okay. And the year that I did it was 2014. Okay. And that year was the 60th anniversary of the race. Oh, so wow. it was a big, big event that year. Yeah, and it's been going on for a long time. Yeah, and yeah, it was wow. also that year happened to be the 100th anniversary of the canal. So it was oh. another anniversary. Man, that's amazing. Yeah, uh, so I was very lucky to go that year. Very. Uh, the unlucky part was that they had the worst conditions that they've had in 60 years. <laughs> mm. like, what, so like what were the conditions? Oh, my gosh, windy and choppy. So mm. imagine taking your outrigger canoe out with no ama in windy, right. choppy conditions. Yeah, oh, geez. Fun times. <laughs> yeah, fun times. Okay, so they're called what again? Cay- Cayucos? Cayuco, yes. Okay. Cayuco. And there was something special about the paddle. So the paddle has to be made from native Panamanian wood. And they're seriously the most beautiful things I've seen, like, hands down. Amazing. Mm. Um, they look a lot like outrigger paddles. Okay. And you can get them customized in the sense of you know double bend shaft or no bend all that stuff um but there are certain guys in panama that make them and that's their craft it's amazing so right around the time of year of the cayuco races i would imagine they're super busy crafting these gorgeous paddles that are just they're works of art i mean i was so proud to have mine and bring it back to the states and they're shorter than a, an outrigger paddle. Because you're not so sitting I, up as high? Yeah. Right. So I wouldn't mm-hmm. be able to use it for outrigger paddling. Okay. Um, but I, I don't think I want to use it again. It's just so beautiful. <laughs> Put oh, it on my wall. <laughs> so tell me more about the actual race itself or the experience. So the first day, well, we went out for a practice the day before um, just to get used to our boat because we had I had practiced with my crew up in Florida. Um, but that wasn't our actual boat. It was just another boat that, that we were training in just mm. to get used to that feeling of, oh, my gosh, I'm going to tip over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So we went out the day before and practiced. Um, I was lucky enough to get stung by a stingray that day. I couldn't believe Yikes. it. Seriously? <laughs> right. 
Wow. Yeah, 40 some years living on the ocean as a California girl and had never been stung by a stingray. And I go mm. down to Panama and whack, get one right then. Oh, man. So eh, it was all right. Survived, You're here to tell obviously. the story, though. Yeah. So the first day of the race, um, you start on the Atlantic side. It's a fairly short day. If I remember correctly, it's about eight miles. We tipped once that day. Okay. Because of What's, the wind. Okay. So you have, I mean, you have to get moving. I would assume it's very similar to like a giant surf ski. Yeah. I've never been in a surf ski, but okay. I, you know, it's, you've got four paddlers. You've got, um, two on, two are paddling on the left, two are paddling on the right. The person in the back is steering, but with their feet, there's like a little, oh, okay. There's like a, yeah, yeah. Thing. yeah. So it is, it's like a surf ski. Yeah. Sounds like it. Okay. And yeah, if one person's wiggling a little too much, you You're, tend to want to counter that wiggle and then Sure, and then, and then the whole thing wobbles like a skateboard going fast downhill. <laughs> yeah. That's a good analogy. Yeah. Exactly. So our first day we, we tipped, but we managed to right ourselves, um, <clears throat> excuse me, partly because yeah. we were close enough to a shallow spot that we could stand up and right it, bail the boat out and hop Get back, back in and, and go. continue. Okay. Yeah. How, so how second, many... How many people participate? I'm just trying to grab like a scope of it. Like oh, how big is the actual question. race? So yeah. the, the year that I went, there were 88 boats and I think that's their limit. I don't think they allow, uh, there, there's a certain cap. It's not just endless amounts of entrance. Okay. Um, I believe they allow 11 boats that are international. So um, non-Panamanian racers. So we were one of the 11. Okay, came down. all right. Uh, on my team were paddlers who had grown up in the canal zone of Panama, so they oh, had neat. raced in this race as high schoolers. It's very common that the high school uh, teams race and quite often win because they're really, really good. Oh wow, what a great, what a great thing for high schoolers to be doing. Yeah, Jeez, imagine yeah. growing up doing that. So yeah, cool. right. That's fantastic. Okay, so go so ahead. day two, day two. We at, at the end of day one, you know, you take your boat boat out, you put it on the storage racks. It's got a number. Um, you're assigned a number. You're assigned um, a location for your boat. Mm. So you're basically portaging your boat. And Got it. So day two, we, we're taking the boats to the boat launch, and the organizers say, be careful out there. It's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, God, <laughs> what am I getting myself into? Yeah. And they were not lying. Oh, like, geez. It wouldn't be bad on an outrigger canoe. It wouldn't be bad at all. Yeah. Um, but because it was a Cayuco, and we weren't overly experienced in, I mean, my team had done it before, but they weren't like, you know, these people that did it every single year. Okay. Um, so we had our challenges for sure. And we were one of 33 boats that flipped over. Oh, wow. Yeah. It was a wet day. Out of sure. <laughs> and we got to the point we could not get our boat righted again. It mm. was just the waves were so choppy. The water was washing in and the bow and stern of the Cayuco is hollow, so the water just pours in and, and collects it. there. Yeah, okay. Um, in hindsight, if we had known that this would happen, it would be nice to have like an air bladder or something to fill that spot so that the water sure. couldn't get in there, or at least sure. to keep it buoyant. But whatever, hindsight. <laughs> we weren't planning on flipping. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so exactly. We're, we're in this giant area called the Banana Channel. Um, Banana Channel. Yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> Sorry. And, no, no, it's great. I think it's a uh, Gatun Lake, and um, we flip over one of many. And the organizers were not at all prepared for the amount of flipping that was going to be going on that day. Sure. And they didn't have enough chase boats or enough support boats. You know, it was mm. basically volunteers that had come out with their own motor boats that Got were it. kind of um, there to help out, but they were not planning on towing 33 boats back to shore. Got it. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah that's a lot. Yeah. It's really hard to get the boat righted. Um, I, I would say the more professional of the type paddling crews could. Their boats flipped and they were able to bail quickly and get back in. And they had a lot more experience with doing that. Sure. Um, my crew, not so much, but that's okay. We had fun. Yeah. So we, a uh, chase boat came along and picked up our uh, paddlers who were a little bit less of the strong swimming variety. Okay. <laughs> uh, just so they wouldn't have to be in the lake. And, sure. and that boat couldn't take our our boat. They couldn't, they didn't have the capacity to drag our boat. So we had to wait. So it was me and two other people. We were hanging out in the banana channel for about an hour. Oh, wow. Uh, I can honestly say I can, I've paddled and swam the Panama Canal. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, geez. 
So lots of fun. Somebody told me there are crocodiles in there. I did not see one. <laughs> I didn't. I was not worried. I, you yeah. Know. Hopefully they told you that after. Uh, no, they told me that going into it, but Perfect. you know, there it's you one go. of those things you can't really worry about. You're going to worry yeah. about a shark and not go no. in the ocean. No. No. Right? What do you do? Yeah. You just embrace yeah. embrace that it's not your world exactly. Exactly. So we swam and talked and you know kept <laughs> pushing, trying to keep the boat um, from drifting too far. Yeah. Uh, one of the girls was a, an avid surfer, so she took advantage of the boat being upside down and she stood on top of it and surfed a few <laughs> waves. <laughs> That's funny. fantastic. Uh, uh, talk about making the best of a weird situation. Right. We had to, you know. Yeah. And then, actually, speaking of making the best of it, this was really awesome. The boat that came by to pick us up, this is probably the coolest part of the story, if you're still hanging in there. <laughs> the oh, boat that I'm, came I'm to here, pick yeah. us up. Um, grabbed us, tied our boat on, and dragged our boat. We caught up with a team that was a paraplegic team. So it was four <clears throat> paddlers that had the use of their upper body, but not their lower body. Mm. Actually, now that I think about it, I guess their steersmen did, so three paddlers. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, they had um, managed to stay upright the entire race at this wow. point. Wow, wow. And while all, you know, 33 of us had flipped over. Yeah. So they were paddling. We caught up with them and we used our boat kind of as a breakwater for them oh, to protect them from the waves that were coming side on to them oh, wow. throughout the rest of the, the course of that day. Oh, wow. And we were passing them water and whatnot. So it was oh, neat fantastic. to be there cheering. We were like their own personal cheering squad. Yeah. And seeing them in to the final stretch of day two, which was really oh. neat. So I, oh, that's I was fantastic. honored to be part of that. Yeah, I got goosebumps just thinking about it. That was cool. So that then cool. we bring our boats in at the end of day two, stay the night in the hotel. And then day three, for me, was the, the coolest day because I had never done it before. The people on my team were like, oh, it's the most boring day. You go through the locks. And I was what? Like, what? The most boring? Yeah. <laughs> it's like so cool. It's so, so boring. You go through the locks. <laughs> yeah, right? You're like, oh, it's just hot and it's boring. You just sit there. But, you know, me being brand new to this and never, having never seen the locks before. Yeah, you're soaking the, the whole thing. thing. Right. So tell me about day three. So they assign you a row in the locks, and it's based on your um, your position in the race. Hmm. Uh, we had flipped, so we were in row eleven or whatever the last row, uh, row eight, row eight, because they did it by they did eight rows of eleven boats. Got it. So we okay. were in the back. Got it. Which provided a fabulous vantage because I could see all the other boats in front of us. Yeah. Um, so they call you in to your row, and so row one all enters the lock. They hold on to each other, one next to the other. They run a rope from the from one side of the lock to the other side of the lock. And the f person in the front seat one holds the rope, and the person in the back holds a rope. Oh, okay. And those ropes are to keep you from getting sucked to the front of the lock when the water is all getting drained out. So you can oh, imagine wow. the current going by. Yeah, I'm sure it's intense, yeah. Yeah, seriously intense. So then they call row two in, and row two gets aligned in row three and so on. So we were in row eight in the back. It takes about an hour, I think, for the lock to, for the water to drain out and you need to get down to the next level oh. and then the gates get released and you paddle out. So you're in there for an hour. You have to put on a life vest in case, God forbid, you fall out of your boat and get sucked <laughs> get in sucked with the water. In. Oh, wow, jeez. But it was like a party <laughs> in there. It was amazing. So people oh. brought water guns oh, and- cool. The guys up on the side were throwing down oranges and fruit and stuff. Um, people were creating these big water splashes and with their paddles and stuff. The photos from that day are amazing. Just the colors of all the boats, the colors of people's jerseys, the beautiful wood patterns on the paddles. Oh, it's, neat. They're the most beautiful photos from that trip ever i, I oh, love that's that fantastic day. um could i could we get some of those and i'll put them in the show notes for people to see absolutely yeah yep. how oh. cool okay cool so, um, so we went through so you're hanging locks, out i think yeah water gun fight i just i'm i'm kind of i'm picturing that a bunch of paddlers holding on to ropes hanging out in in the panama canal having a water gun fight what a what a cool idea <laughs> that's so cool <laughs> It, it was it was pretty pretty amazing, and I kept thinking, wow, you know, they're serious about their paddling, but they're 
Serious just, about their fun? <laughs> right. They're ju- they have just that streak of fun to bring o- bring along a water gun. And not one of those little tiny water pistols. Like, I'm talking like a super soaker where they can shoot the boat that's like five rows back, you know? Yeah. Wow. I love it. Okay. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. That's so That's so cool. So then, you know, we go through those three locks. I think it was three at that point. Um, and... And then you, know, you paddle a little bit more. There's these giant shipping container barges on one side of you, and you're paddling. You know, not that close, but it feels like you're close. Sure. Uh, and then you get to the end of the race, and there's all these people with signs and banners, and it's just really neat. It's 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 just a big, amazing race in Panama that everyone is super supportive of. And mm. it was a lot of fun. I had nobody there cheering me at the finish line, and yet I had everybody there everybody. cheering me at the finish line. Yeah. Because it, they're just cheering every boat that comes past the finish line. Like, yay, you did it. This was awesome. It was so much fun. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. And so definitely uh, the, the coolest experience I've ever had paddling, by far. <laughs> it's such a good story, too. I can't wait to see the pictures, but I'm, I'm imagining these Cayucos and all of the like fancy paint and um, these handcrafted paddles and just, it sounds like everybody gets involved in something like this. Like yeah, the whole place comes alive for this kind of thing. It's a, definitely a cultural experience. And you mentioned the boats uh, and I forgot to talk about that as far as the painting goes. You know, every boat is privately owned. So it's got a name to the boat. It's got a painting on it of some sort. Some mm-hmm. much more elaborate than others. I remember one, the the nose of the boat looked like a toucan. Oh, and cool. it's just gorgeous colors. So they're all named differently. And some have sponsors. Uh, and it's just, it's seriously a color feast for the eyes. Oh, what a great way to say it, too. Oh, that's fantastic. <sighs> okay. I like that story. Yeah. It's fun. Uh, so, but aside, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Uh, aside from okay. paddling, we're going to shift gears a little bit. Aside from paddling and having that be a vehicle, I guess a vehicle or an inspiration to take you around the world. <laughs> you went around the world. <laughs> you went around the world before. Kristen is sticking her tongue out at me, guys. <laughs> uh, you traveled before uh, like, because no, just a little bit <laughs> because you were a model, right? Yes, I was. I I was not. Well, okay, I have to admit to that. Yes, I was lucky enough to travel quite a bit. I was never anything super, but I did a lot of sports type modeling um mm-hmm. a lot of ads for sports things so yes but, yeah. but, but, I, but i don't tell anybody that so okay you know, fine <clears throat> shame on you okay but uh you did have a fun story about playing pool at eddie murphy's house is <laughs> yeah. that real is that you're, you're being serious yeah yeah oh, being serious that's one of the greatest you know when you go to the parties that people say like oh tell us one fact that nobody knows about you I'm like oh well that's a good one okay so um, one fact that nobody knows about you is yeah, so when I was in college at UCLA, um, one of the girls that I modeled with was friends with Eddie Murphy, shall we say, I guess? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's maybe the best way to put it. We were at the Roxbury Club, which what? I think shut down and then is open again, I believe. Okay. Could be wrong. I think it's uh, open again yeah. in Roxbury on Sunset. Okay. Um, in the VIP there area there. And I was like a college student that was, you know, the best way to put it is I was surface modeling. I wasn't like in that world completely. I was okay. doing it alongside getting my degree at UCLA. So right. yeah. this was a world that I hadn't really gotten into, you mm-hmm. know, going to the Roxbury and that whole thing. I was more like, I'm going to go home and study. <laughs> <laughs> so one night I find myself at the Roxbury with this girl and like what the heck and we end up leaving there and going to eddie murphy's house for a party which again i'm like what (laughs) how did i end up here so yeah i i played pool at eddie murphy's house i played against michael buffer who i did not know who he was at the time there were a lot of people there who i did not know who they were and later i found out who is michael buffer i don't he is the guy who um coined the term let's get ready to rumble oh really yeah, he introduces all the Mike Tyson fights. And, well, oh man! Know, I guess. Oh, got it. Did did you? I <laughs> did. He, I just gotta add, like you're playing pool before you started. Did he say that? No. Because <laughs> that would have totally been amazing. Should have. <laughs> right? He's like, "Do you want to play pool?" And you're like, "Yeah." And then he says it, and that's fantastic. Oh. That would have been totally awesome. No, I didn't even know who he was. Like, oh, okay, I will admit to being kind of an idiot when it comes to fame and famous people and whatnot. Like, I met sure. Heavy D. Remember Heavy D? Yeah, Heavy D. Okay, so he was in the kitchen at Eddie Murphy's house. 
What? And I had no idea who he was. Right. And the caretaker at Eddie Murphy's house was like, uh, Kristen, you know who Heavy D is? And me being shy, I'm like looking at the ground and I go, um, I've I've heard of him. And he- Heavy D looks at me and goes, I ain't never heard of you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And I was like, <gasps> Oh, that's funny. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not really like in the know when it comes to celebrities, I will admit. So I'm yeah. playing pool with Michael Buffer, and I didn't know who he was. And actually, he ended up driving me home because the friend that I went to Eddie Murphy's house with disappeared. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> no idea what happened to her that night. Right. Um, she disappeared. And it was like five in the morning. Oh, wow. And Little me who, let me just get for the record, I don't drink, I don't do drugs, nothing. So I'm like the major sober one at this party. Right, right. And it's five in the morning and I've been playing pool with this guy who I don't know who he is. And he says, well, you know, if you if you want, I can give you a ride home. Because we're up in the Hollywood Hills. Or sure. Beverly, Bel Air, I think we were. Okay. I don't know. What am I going to do, walk home? You know, the yeah. bus doesn't go by Eddie Murphy's house, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so... He gave me a ride and, you know, I just had to trust this person. I had no idea who he was. Yeah. I just had to trust that he was a nice guy and not going to take advantage of this sure. little college student. So he's dropping me off at my dorm in oh, wow. UCLA, my dorm. Oh, wow. <laughs> and on the ride, we started talking and I asked him what he did. Like, you know, what is your job? What do you do? And he told me that he announces the Mike Tyson fights. Well, it still didn't mean anything to me at that point. I didn't right. watch boxing. I wasn't big on that. Okay. And uh, later I asked somebody and they're like, oh my God, that's <laughs> Michael Buffer. He's like, you know, the let's get, le- let's get ready to rumble. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I've heard that. Yeah. How funny. So, yeah. But he was such a gentleman, you know, dropped me off at my dorm. Nice. Gave me a sweet kiss on the cheek, I think, or the hand, like very, you know, gentlemanly. Like, you know, I would like to thank him for that if he ever is listening to a podcast by Callie Badler. I love it. <laughs> he, he was wonderful. It was it made an impression on me, you know. Nice gentleman. Thank you for indulging <laughs> the fun uh the fun side of um some of the cool things that you've done. So, uh roller, Bizarre stories. <laughs> yeah, rollerblade and Gatorade, right? That's who you like modeled for? Yeah, yep. I did um I did a TV ad for Gatorade that aired oh. in Brazil. Oh cool. Um, basically, we got to play volleyball for 3 days on Zuma Beach. So Oh, oh geez, wow. <laughs> Yeah, and get paid for it. Okay. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah, game. Yeah. Okay, so that that's super awesome. fun. Yeah, that's super fun. And Thank uh, you. rollerblade, I got to rollerblade for I think two days doing a shoot. That was a um, ad campaign that they had for their new rollerblades back in the mid nineties. Okay. And actually, here's a really cool little little fun fact. All right. Um, that ad, one of so they did a series of ads. One of those ads ran in Rolling Stone magazine the same issue that one of my brother's ads was in Rolling Stone. So my brother is a graphic designer. He used to design ads for No Fear. Do you remember that? Yeah, totally. Game? Totally. Okay, so he was their graphic designer for years. Wow, how neat. And so my parents had both of their kids in Rolling Stone, the same <laughs> issue. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> cool? Yeah, you could never, you could probably never predict or even imagine that. That's so cool. No, Do you, you, you have the issue, right? Plan it. <laughs> yeah, you have the issue, don't you? I hope. Like four I or five do have copies. the issue, but I don't know where it is right now, but I have it. Oh, that's so cool. Okay, so we got a little tangent but I think it's fantastic anyway. <laughs> let's come Let's come back to the Dragon Boat world, if we could. One of the things that I thought would be pretty, you would have some insight into. I'm curious to know who are some of your heroes or icons or mentors in the Dragon Boat world, people that you're inspired by big, or excited about big questions big yeah. questions well there's a lot of them you know when i was just in florida i was in a very small dragon boating community because in florida the the paddling world hasn't it's starting to grow mm. uh, but at the time i started it wasn't as big and so we always looked up to coaches that came down typically from canada okay. to coach us uh, and uh, we learned from them. So now that I'm up in Toronto training, I'm training with uh, one of the national team coaches, Chris Edwards. He's amazing. Oh, you're, um, you are now, right now? Yes. Oh, yeah. great. Oh, wow. We're, we're doing winter training. Don't worry. We're not on the water yet. It's a little cold. <laughs> <laughs> so we're indoors at the paddle pool and doing paddle erg sessions and things oh, cool. like that. 
Yeah. But, you know, I've been coached in a lot of different sports in my life. I grew up playing baseball and soccer and volleyball and I had a lot of different coaches. So I can honestly say that Chris Edwards is an amazing coach. I look up to him a lot. He's been an amazing mentor and, you know, I'd probably hang on every word he says. Oh, wow. That's cool. <laughs> because he has a lot of good insights. He has amazing analogies. He'll explain things 12 different ways to make sure that we understand it. And, mm. and that's great. Um, Scott Murray is another fabulous coach up here that I've, I've been lucky enough to work with a little bit. And Jim Farintosh is a legend in the paddling community here in Canada and I think worldwide. And he runs a camp in Melbourne, Florida. Mm. And last year I was honored to be asked to coach at their camp. Oh, so, wow. How cool. Um, he added me to his his staff for the he calls it bow wave it's bow wave camp oh, or cool. clinic and it runs for three weeks in april so i'll be actually oh, driving long... down to florida next week okay to go coach at his camp for two weeks oh neat you're excited so, about that i can see super excited yeah it's a lot of uh -huh. fun it's neat because you get together with i met a lot of other coaches that i wouldn't have met otherwise mm -hmm. um some from dartmouth uh, up here in canada some from um, Vancouver and you know OC coaches as well as uh, Dragon Boat coaches because he does an outrigger component as well so sure. people okay. can learn how to get on one and two man outriggers got it uh, so I met all these amazing coaches that I probably wouldn't have met otherwise you know, Albert oh, wow. McDonald Tim Shouse Don and Trevor run the the OC camp and they're amazing Anthony Sword and then I work with some of the coaches that I knew from the States, um, Megan Kress and Joanne Fegley, Hype, uh, they're fabulous coaches, but it, it's just fun. It was really neat last year. We were all in the coach's apartment and it's like, just, it's kind of like nerdy camp uh, <laughs> for coaches because you're just yeah. bouncing ideas off of each other. Yeah, and, what, a, you know, what we, a great energy. Yeah, over dinner, there's six or eight of us sitting there in the apartment talking about, okay, you know, I have this paddler that keeps doing this. How can I, how can I work with him or her to fix mm. this and mm -hmm. it, it's just all this amazing nerdy paddle energy coming together and synthesizing and working yeah. things out and i was in heaven i was absolutely in heaven so i would I'll, say that all of those people are my my mentors and i look up to them all oh wow yeah but uh paddlers listening well are probably pretty inspired by the fact that you guys all of our coaches get together and try to help each other become better which only makes all of us better as a whole that's so cool to hear I think that's one of the unique things about Jim's camp is that the coaches are working together because so often, you know, it's a competitive sport. I'm not going to sure. lie. So sure. if if you're talking about someone's home team, that coach is less likely to share ideas, strategies, etc., with another team in the area or other team that they might be competing against. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot less communication going on. Whereas at a camp, where your boat is not what you're competing with necessarily. Right, right. Uh, there's no competition there. And so there's no reason. Collaboration is the key, not competition. I love that. I love that. Collaboration is the key, not competition. That's so good. We all get ahead when we do that. Indeed. Yeah, we all get ahead. Um, how fun. Okay. That's so good. I'm just soaking it all in. So uh, we're coming kind of t towards the end, but I wanted to... Okay, so I wanted to ask what would you what how would you share what would you say to newbies who are curious about dragon boat oh that's a good like, question yeah what would you let me say that, what would be your advice or your mentorship or your guiding light to newbies who are curious to dragon boat i even wrote a whole blog post on that did you yes my okay. advice to my newbie self i think it was titled oh i love it okay tell me about that yeah well you know, I, I can't quote it off the top of my head right now, but the things that come to mind, um, like I said, my first day out, I was like, oh my gosh, everything hurts. You know, <laughs> obviously my arms hurt because I didn't know how to paddle and I was using my arms and I was mortified that I kept banging into the person in front of me because I was watching my own paddle instead of paying attention to timing. You know, all those little things right, that you're very right. self-conscious about sure. when you first hop on a boat with everyone. And the thing is, we all started somewhere. We all yeah. had to learn to paddle. Now, most of us did it as an adult, but, well, I shouldn't say most of us. Many of us in the dragon boating community did it. We learned how to paddle as an adult. We weren't fortunate enough to learn at a young age. 
So we were maybe more aware or self-conscious of that learning process and the learning curve. And I think when you learn a sport as a young child, you aren't as self-conscious. You just kind of go with it and make your mistakes and who cares. But as an adult, we're aware of that. So I would say to just understand that everybody's been there at some point and don't worry about those mistakes you're making. Just learn from them and allow yourself to make those mistakes and also to focus on one thing at a time because as we all know, when you start thinking about, oh, I don't know, your top hand, then you know your bottom elbow goes to crap <laughs> or your timing gets lost or whatever. The, the, yeah. the minute you focus entirely on one thing to work on that or improve it, everything else kind of falls apart as you're developing your skills. Hmm. And it's a lifelong learning opportunity, I think. In, in, nobody's a perfect paddler. We've all got stuff to learn. So yeah. be patient with yourself and, and enjoy the process. Yeah, enjoy the process. What about from a cultural perspective for people who are maybe new to it from that aspect as well? Ooh, cultural aspect. Well, we talked about tribe. I think if you get with the right team, they really become your family. And that's one of the coolest aspects of dragon boating, in my opinion. Yeah, I love the workout. Yeah, I love being on the water. But I also love the fact that I've got a team. Right now, I'm training with a team up here in Toronto that's the Outer Harbor Senior Women. They're amazing. Oh, wow. And cool. I really count them among some of my closest friends. You know, it's a team of about 28 women who I could call on any of them if I had a problem. They're that's just, awesome. They're amazing. And we look out for each other, and it's a good it's a good feeling to have. And I think that that's the cultural aspect of the team. It really brings people together. Yeah, I think the thing the same is it's the same in dragon boat as it is in outrigger as it like yeah. e- even you know even things like sup are individual yet the collective is is so bonded and strong. Indeed, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a shared mentality, and that, that's shared what mentality. bonds us. I think. Mm-hmm. I love it. What was it like to, I just, I'm having this thought, what was it like to go to these other countries where this sport is so rooted in history and participate? Wow. Well, hmm. That's a deep question. Let's see. So is that what you meant by cultural aspect? And I took it the wrong way. No, 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 that, 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 that's a secondary piece. Yeah. All right. You scared me. Also. No, 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 no. The, the question. No, no, no. The culture of dragon, but like is, is what it, it, no, you got it exactly right. It just made me, it led to this one where I'm like, oh, but got you it. know, got like it. what's it like to, you know, play soccer in Brazil? Like that kind of thing. Right. Like work. Right. You know, yeah. Okay. I see. Um, wow. I know people that have traveled in China and, and raced in some of the very, very traditional races. Um, so traditional that like apparently the men race on one boat and the women race on another boat and they don't have mixed crews mm-hmm. um, or the women just don't race at all because it's very much a men's thing. That's like the fishermen are racing. Um, that would be really amazing to see. I have not been to those type of races. Okay. Uh, but in Hong Kong, for example, you know, it's mm-hmm. very much a tradition, part of their culture for sure. Uh, and it's neat to see that side of it where everybody's participating and there are spectators. I have an amazing photo. I don't know if I can find it to share it with you, but I can picture it if that counts. (laughs) And it's about six or seven guys who are on their break at lunch who are wearing hard hats still. They were construction workers and they're on their scaffolding, taking a break, watching the dragon boat races that we were participating in. Oh, cool. It's such a cultural thing. You know, they have giant grandstands there to watch the races Mm. in Hong Kong. Whereas you go to a race in Florida and I don't even know that they put up grandstands because it's just not really a spectator sport. It's not part of our culture here. Yeah. So it's neat that there it's a big deal. You know, we got off the plane in Hong Kong and there are advertisements for the dragon boat races. Oh, like, wow. oh my god you know we're all taking our pictures where they're going wow this is amazing yeah that is cool <laughs> and then everywhere around town in the area were signs advertising for the races oh wow so it's a whole different world because you know definitely in florida it's more of just a local thing and like all right there's a dragon boat race this weekend <laughs> you know? yeah huh so it's more uh, it's more ingrained in society yeah i would i would imagine that that's what it would be like and that was the perspective i was looking for too 
Well, my goodness, you have got some serious stories. <laughs> this is so much fun, and I know that people are going to dig this. I want them to be able to connect with you um, some more. So how can people find you and get to start reading more of your posts and hopefully meet you in person maybe so my blog is paddlechica.com okay and they can contact me on that i also have a facebook page paddle chica obviously i have an instagram account paddle chica and twitter as well although i will admit to not being as good about twitter i'm still <laughs> i think figuring twitter out shame on yeah. me yeah oh, it's okay um, I think you've so, got a few other channels that are pretty significant for people to to know what's going on. So, I've I've got the Facebook thing down. I I have uh, you know kids who are advising me on the Instagram thing. I love it. <laughs> I think I'm too old for that too, <laughs> but it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I'll also, like I said, I'll be coaching at uh, Jim's camp in Melbourne the 16th of April through the 30th, I believe, or 29th. Okay. Is the camp full, or do you know if the camps? Uh, last I heard like, that week one, that? which I won't be at week one, but week okay. one had space, but they can always contact Jim if they're interested. Um, well, they can look on my, on my Facebook page. Actually, I put up an ad for Jim's camp. So okay, perfect. the information cool. is there. Cool. Okay, uh, cool. And then I'll be racing in Canada this summer. I'll be at uh, a bunch of different races in Canada, in Lachine near Montreal, in the Great White North Challenge Race in Toronto and the Great oh, nice. White North Sport Race. Um, and nationals as well in Welland. So my team is hoping to go to nationals so then we can go on to um, Hungary to club crew races in 2018. Oh, wow. How cool. You get, yeah, oh, yeah. You've got a whole stack of fun happening. Super excited about that. You know, life is an adventure. You got to take it advantage is. of it. I love it. It's so good. Well, I want to thank you for making some time all the way up north to reconnect with your SoCal roots and chat with me here today. It's been an absolutely honor. my pleasure. Yeah. And I'm super excited to see the things that you're doing. And I know that it's inspiring to others, myself included. And I can't wait to see some of the pics from the Panama Canal um, and be able to share those with people and just put people in contact with you because I think that you have a great energy and a great spirit for the sport, you know, especially I, what I gather is for newbies as well as, you know, experienced people, um, you bring a perspective that's enlightening so i love it i just love it so thank you for coming oh, thank on you. thank you for hanging out with us any last thoughts last thoughts cali paddler is amazing i'm so <laughs> glad that we met you guys are like like my west coast peeps you're awesome yeah oh i love it that's super cool thank you i i wear my cali paddler sweatshirt with pride here in toronto i, yes. I love it i love it okay <laughs> so um, i appreciate you guys thank you so much for having me this was really fun i had a good yeah. time will you come back uh, after Absolutely. you have some more adventures and stuff and share? Definitely. I'll be in California um, the last two weeks in August. I'll actually be there for my birthday. We'll have to meet up. Yeah, let's do that. Sounds let's do good. That. I would All right. love it. Kristen, thank you again. And I will obviously in the show notes put uh, people in contact with how to get a hold of you. And to the Paddlers Pulse people out there, oh, I hope you enjoyed this one. I know I did. And we will see you on the water. Thanks for dropping by to listen in. You, yes you, are the great people that bring paddling to life. Join us next time. And please, don't keep us a secret. Like us on iTunes, share with your buddies, and keep the paddler's pulse pumping. See you on the water.